Hello, my name is Emily Boss, Land Protection Specialist for Franklin Land Trust and Executive Director for the Massachusetts Woodlands Institute. I am a licensed forester in Massachusetts. I studied forests and conservation at UMass Amherst, and I have a master's in forest resources. Franklin Land Trust, where I work, is a regional land trust with headquarters in Shelburne Falls, Massachusetts. We work with landowners, cities and towns, state and federal agencies, along with many other private and nonprofit partners to conserve and protect the natural landscape and our agricultural heritage. Mass Woodlands Institute is a nonprofit subsidiary of Franklin Land Trust, which educates and provides assistance for land management and seeks to support the rural economy. Franklin Land Trust operates in Franklin County and surrounding in the four western counties, Franklin, Hampshire, Berkshire, and Hamden. I'd like to thank and acknowledge that this is the traditional land of indigenous tribal peoples, including the Pakamtuk, Nipmuc, Wabanaki, and Mohican tribes. Over three decades, Franklin Land Trust has conserved over 34,000 acres in our region, including private land held in conservation restriction or agricultural preservation restriction, land acquired by municipalities or state agencies, and land which Franklin Land Trust owns in fee. Franklin Land Trust holds 155 conservation restrictions. I've been asked to talk with you today about our forests and climate change. Living in Western Massachusetts, most of us see trees and forests every day. They are a beautiful and important part of the land that brings a lot of joy to our lives, along with many other important things. Places for wild animals to live, incredible biodiversity of flowers, trees, insects, mushrooms, and countless minerals and organisms in the soil. Places to walk, to see birds, bears, foxes, and trout in our streams. Beautiful views as people travel through our area. And homes, chairs, bowls, and shelves built from the wood from our region's trees. We also enjoy clean air, water, and carbon that's pulled from the atmosphere or sequestered and stored in trees. And things that are made of wood. Forests look still, but they are constantly changing. Trees grow, laying on a growth ring each year. You can count those rings to see how old a tree is. Scientists have studied tree rings to learn about the history of our atmosphere and climate to predict climate change. Forests are made up of many different plants. Groups of types of trees provide homes or habitat to different creatures. Trees die, standing in place as snags or dead trees that house birds, bats, insects, and fungi or are knocked down or destroyed by windstorms, fires, beavers. They go back into the soil and open up the land to sun for young trees to grow. These cycles of disturbance are part of the forested landscape. Woodlands may be young forest, mature forest, or older forests. Openings in the forest are short-lived. Young forests grow up into shady, mature forest. Most of our woods here are mature woods, about 100 years old. Even older forests, called old growth often, which are 200 or 300 or more years old, will have big trees that love shade, lots of dead wood from trees that died and fell or lost branches, and also openings where younger trees grew, in wet meadows near beaver ponds or where wind storms and fire took down trees. In our region, trees will take back the land if allowed to grow. But forests can't grow where there are buildings, roads, parking lots, or where fields are kept open for parks, crops, and pasture. New England, where we live, has several types of woods, which are shown here. The gray to the north in Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont is spruce, fir, and northern hardwoods. Softwoods are evergreen, pine, hemlock, spruce. Hardwoods are trees that lose their leaves in the fall, deciduous trees. Their wood is denser than softwoods. The blue area in the map to the north and in far western Massachusetts is northern hardwoods with some pine and hemlock. Green is transition hardwoods, a mixture of northern and central hardwoods. Pink is central hardwoods with pine and hemlock. Yellow is central hardwoods, which are mostly oak and hickory. You'll see them more to the south in Connecticut and Rhode Island. Our landscape prior to European settlement and colonization was in large part a vast forest with huge white pine trees. Many of those trees were cut and brought to England to be masts for the British Navy. 
This image shows how the trees in our woods have changed. Today, pines, shown as light blue, are a smaller part of our forests. This chart shows how much of these types of trees you'll find in Massachusetts in this period. 39% of our trees are northern hardwoods, which would be maple, birch, beech. 28% are oak hickory. Over half the state is forested, 62%, or 3.1 million acres. One acre is about the size of three quarters of a football field. It's 43,560 square feet, and foresters and some surveyors measure it using a special measure called a chain. A chain is 66 feet long, and 10 chains is a furlong. An acre is a chain by a furlong, or 66 by 660 feet. You don't need to know these things in day-to-day -day life, but it's fun to know. And having something to compare an area to can help you envision how big it is. Almost 80% of the woods in Massachusetts are owned by families, tribes, or private individuals. 10% of our forests are owned by the state, cities, or towns as parks, wildlife management areas, water supply land, and state forests. The Land Back Movement today works to return land to tribal communities. The native peoples of this region, such as the Pocomtuck and Nipmuc tribes, cared for and were supported by the land. You can learn more about this and later history of the land by seeing miniature dioramas of the forest at the Fisher Museum at Harvard Forest. Through collaboration with artists and representatives of the Nipmuc Nation, new exhibits show the history of the forests in unceded land of the Nipmuc Nation, the freshwater people. You can see information online or visit the Fisher Museum at Harvard Forest in Petersham. The Europeans who came to occupy this land cleared much of it to make room for farm fields, as materials to build fences, and as fuel for factories that were built all over our region. There were over 65,000 factories that used water power in the East. Learn more about that history at the Museum of Our Industrial Heritage in Greenfield, Massachusetts. You can visit foundations of old mill factories at sites like the Plainfield Mill Sites on River Road in Plainfield, Mass. The Plainfield Historical Commission owns three mill foundations on eight acres. There is a trail on the Mill River and signs about the history, some of which I made when I studied forestry at UMass Amherst. You can visit the mills online or in person by appointment. In addition to colonization and clearing, pests, pathogen, and disease have changed what trees are in our woods. There was forest lost due to chestnut blight, butternut canker, Dutch elm disease in the 18th and 19th centuries. Those trees are not a major part of our wild forest as a result. Current threats are from things like the Asian longhorn beetle targeting maples. In response, there was a successful eradication program in eastern Massachusetts. Others still in progress are the emerald ash borer spreading from the U.S. Midwest. Hemlock woolly adelgid, which does well in warmer winters, is shown here. And beech bark disease affects our beech trees. Loss of forests due to building and development continues to change our land. So let's look at a few trees around us. They are part of different aged forest groups. A form of poplar is quaking aspen. Poplar is an important wildlife tree. Almost every part of the tree can be eaten by animals. It grows straight with light colored bark and leaves shaped like rounded spades. They flutter in the wind due to the unique flattened shape of the leaf stems. Poplar grows quickly and needs lots of light. It dies off as taller trees that tolerate shade better outgrow them. It won't grow in mature and older forests. It needs openings to grow. Sugar maple. Sugar maples are tall trees with gray bark and five pointed medium sized leaves that are very recognizable. There is a maple leaf on the Canadian flag, for example. Sugar maple is common in mature woods here. You will often see big ones in the middle of a forest along a stone wall. Sometimes these are called wolf trees. Farmers loved them and let them grow big to tap their syrup when other trees around were cut to open the land for fields and pasture. Sugar maples have seeds that you'll see in the fall. They flutter down like helicopter rotors. Animals eat those seeds. And of course, sugar maples are called that for their very sweet sap that runs in the late winter and early spring. 64 gallons of sap is spoiled down to make one gallon of maple syrup. 
Other trees can be tapped. You can make syrup from red maples, silver maples, and various birches. But you need even more sap to make as much maple syrup from the others. Sugar maple provides a durable, light, and evenly colored, sometimes called close-grained, wood that is useful for building many different things. Wood floors, tables, chairs, stairs, and cabinets. Some maple has discolorations in the wood caused by bacteria. It's called spalted maple. Some has unusual burrs or patterns in the grain that shine and make unique textures in the finished wood products. Here's an example of curly maple. Sugar maple trees are highly prized and cultivated by farmers and tree farmers in stands they call a sugar bush. That sounds like one big plant, but it's actually a large area of woods, which could be acres with mostly sugar maple. Eastern hemlock. This shade tolerant tree, it can be found in old growth areas. Few stands of hemlocks that you will see in this area are that old, however. It naturally makes dense stands of just hemlock. The tree loves the shade and its needles block the light. Other trees that need more light can't grow there and die off. You can visit old growth forests and walk a trail where you can see ancient and giant white pines and black cherry trees at the William Cullen Bryant Homestead of the Trustees of Reservations. Their rivulet trail follows a stream that runs through an old growth forest that has trees that are 300 years old. You can see more information about this online or visit the trail in person in Cummington, Massachusetts. How does climate affect the forest? There are many ways that scientists think climate change will affect our region. These are based on observation or modeling and projections. Weather effects are expected. More frequent intense weather events like storms and flooding. Higher average temperatures. Shorter winters with less snow cover. People on the coast will likely see sea levels rise. Warmer temperatures with fewer days below freezing means a longer growing season for plants and crops. However, the changes to the start of warmer days means plants adapted to past patterns could be at a disadvantage or experience stress. Plants and animals used to cooler temperatures may do poorly. They may be found less often to the southern part of their ranges. These types of trees we have here in our region are likely to change again. What trees are in our forests will depend on what seeds animals spread, what people plant, as well as some seeds that travel on the wind. Our forests in 50 years might look different from what we see today. We are likely to have more oaks and hickory like forests to the south and fewer evergreens and hardwoods found in forests to the north. Insects, fungi, diseases, they spread into our region. Some do better in warmer temperatures. Others may kill trees that are stressed by changing temperatures or rainfall or changing rainfall patterns. Let's see how those trees that we looked at closely will be affected. The range of quaking aspen may change. Models show that it might not do as well here. Also, suppression of beavers and development of open fields reduces where these trees may grow, losing important wildlife habitat. Sugar maple is also expected to do poorly in changing climate. Harvesting sap for syrup is affected by shorter winters. With less snowfall, there is often a shorter time to tap sap for the syrup. Hemlocks are affected by shorter winters too. The hemlock woolly adelgid spreads more and can kill off trees or whole stands in the forest. Hemlock provides shade for cool streams that are special habitat for native fish. Increasing temperatures plus the loss of hemlock along streams threatens to warm up streams and make them unlivable. At Franklin Land Trust, we were concerned about the woods that we steward. We wanted to learn what to expect and to see what we could do to protect them and the creatures that live there. We took a course on climate change and forests and looked at land that we own in Buckland called Walnut Hill Woods. This land is on the top of Walnut Hill. It has both northern hardwoods, the central type of woods we talked about with maples, pines, hemlock, and beech, and also transitional hardwoods from the south of our region with more oaks in it. It has a big sugar bush on it, 
managed by a nearby farmer who makes maple syrup. It also has special flowers that grow in certain places in the woods where the soil is rich. These spring ephemerals are unusual and some are quite rare. There is a network of trails on the land, some of which are quite steep and have been eroded by rain. There are wetlands and a vernal pool. Our goals in managing this property are to protect rare and threatened plants and animals, to keep trees in the woods healthy, to protect air and water and soils, to store and sequester carbon, and to support farms and wood businesses, and also to provide trails for people to enjoy the woods. Taking the course on climate change in woods helped us understand that the shorter winters with less snow may make it harder to get sap from the sugar maples in the sugar bush. The trees may also not be as healthy in the future due to changing conditions. Intense rainfall could wash away our trails. Changes in the growing season might affect the spring ephemeral flowers and invasive insects like hemlock woolly adelgid could harm the trees. This helped us decide to do some different things in the future. For our sugar bush, we will work with a farmer to watch the health of the trees. And we may mix the maples with other species in case they get sick. We'll improve our trails so they won't erode as quickly. We'll watch to see the how the hemlock woolly adelgid affects our hemlock. We've already seen some there, but so far the trees haven't been killed off. Warmer winters might make it worse. We may gather seed from the spring ephemeral plants to help provide seed for planting in other areas. The Native Plant Trust has a program we can participate in. We also hope to observe the plants over time to help capture information about climate change effects. There's an area in the woods that used to be homes when the town was settled by Europeans. You can see an old cellar hole there filled in now by dirt and with trees growing in it. There are still poplars growing here. We could cut some trees to help more poplars grow and make a patch of young forest habitat in the surrounding mature forest. You can learn more about Walnut Hill Woods and other properties that Franklin Land Trust owns or visit them in person. You can find directions, maps, and information about the land at our website here at Franklin Land Trust places to visit. To learn more about climate change and managing forests, you can visit the Adaptation Workbook online and the Northern Institute of Applied Climate Science and these other groups provide information about how forests will be affected. You can visit these sites to study and learn. We are continuing to learn more about forests, about climate change, about wildlife habitat, and people's interactions with the land all the time. We need to be flexible and keep learning and adapting to how we take care of the land and each other. We are all neighbors of the woodlands here and we can all do our part to steward the land. I hope you get out in the woods soon and think about how important and complex a part of the world it is. Thank you so much for letting me visit with you. Hope to see you out in the woods.